In this episode, uh, we're going to take a look at one of these things. Uh, I know this is this is ancient history for some of you. Uh, it's called a camera, and it shoots with film. There are times when I would go someplace to uh, study a site, and I wanted to record it for my next book. I'd run around and take a whole bunch of pictures, and then leave, come back home, get them developed later, and see if I could use them in the book. There are times when you take pictures of one of these, with one of these, and uh, you get more than you expected. That's the case with the uh, Point of Bach Lighthouse and uh, what I discovered there by accident when I ran around with this very camera. This thing weighs about a ton. Wherever you find a lighthouse, you'll probably find a ghost. If the folks in charge of the property tell you they don't have a ghost, they're either fibbing because they don't want the cast and crew of ghost hunters showing up, or they just haven't met their ghost yet, or they're some of the very few unlucky ones who don't have a ghost yet. I've written and researched two books on the subject out of my 20, and I can tell you that about half of the folks won't readily admit that they have a ghost. But if you talk to them privately and professionally, they often will then admit that they have a ghost, and on occasion, they'll have named the apparition. Our story today is that of the Point of Bach Lighthouse and how I accidentally photographed the ghost that resides there. On November 29th, 1998, I had a few days off from flying, and I was up in Michigan. After attending a shipwreck show and book signing, I took the long way back to my parents' house in Freeland, Michigan, in order to visit the lighthouse at Point Abac. The locality is properly pronounced Point Abac, and not Pointy Ox Burks and it is located near the tip of Michigan's Thumb. I'd been researching a story that was related to me that summer. The caretakers of the property, Ray and Martha, spent the summer months living at the keeper's quarters, and in the winter months, they locked things up and simply visited the site regularly. Their first hint that the place was haunted came during the off-season. Ray would tend to the grounds, lock up, and drive home. Then in the middle of the night, he'd get a call from the sheriff's office telling him that all the lights were on. He'd return, unlock the keeper's house, check to make sure no one had broken in, turn off the lights, and relock the building. A few hours later, he'd get another call that the lights were on again. Such little pranks happened, but they were never more than annoying. Pamela, the adult daughter of the two caretakers, was often invited to come and spend the night at the house, but the place simply gave her the creeps. Finally, she agreed to spend one night. All was quiet as Pamela settled in to sleep with the family dog, Shadow, at her side. Pamela slept soundly until suddenly she awoke for no reason at all. It was one of those things we all experience where your eyes simply pop open and there you are in the middle of the night wide awake for no reason whatsoever. She noticed that Shadow the dog was no longer at her side, but instead was lying in the doorway, gazing toward the stairs. She called to the dog, but Shadow didn't move. Finally, she got out of bed to see what Shadow was gazing at. There at the bottom of the stairs, Pamela saw a figure of a woman. She was dressed in white, standing at the bottom of the stairs, looking up at her. The woman was slender, was wearing a long white house dress, with a cooking apron tied around the waist and turned down. Her dress was long-sleeved and had a high collar. Her hair was up in a bun, as if she were going about doing housework. She had her hand on the banister and gazed directly toward Pamela. Amazingly, 
Pamela wasn't frightened. Instead, a feeling of being welcomed overcame her. As if this person was trying to tell her that it was okay for Pamela to stay at the lighthouse. Just as that realization struck Pamela, the woman turned and walked away through the door and toward the lighthouse. Of course, when I heard that story, Martha and Ray wanted to know if I could research it, which I happily went to work doing. As part of my research, I stopped at the Point of Bach Lighthouse. And on the site, I wanted to take about 36 photos of the whole place. In the final days of November, the entire place had been secured and padlocked shut for more than a month. I shot my roll of 36 and headed back to my home and my flight schedule. I received the developed photos a week later and set them aside for another week. It was just before Christmas when I was looking through the photos to see which one would work the best for my upcoming book. And that was when I noticed this. In two of the photos of the keeper's quarters that I had shot, just about 90 seconds apart, there was something different. It was in the north window of the upstairs bedroom's dormer. At first I thought it may be a reflection, but there was nothing that large in front of the house that could make such a reflection. I grabbed my jeweler's loop and put it on both images, and here's what I saw. To me it looked an awful lot like someone had pulled the sheer curtain aside and was looking out through the window. There was just one problem. The place had been locked up for nearly two months. Of course, I knew the story, so maybe I was prejudiced. Thus, I took the photos upstairs where my wife and sister-in-law were baking Christmas cookies. I handed them to my sister-in-law, who had no idea what I was working on, and asked her, tell me what is the difference between these two pictures. Within seconds, she simply said, well, someone's looking out of the window in that one. First thing I did was I called Pamela to confirm that that was the bedroom in which she had been sleeping the night she saw the ghost. I asked her, have people been teasing you because you saw the ghost? She replied, oh, yes. I told her she could tell them all to take a hike because I have a picture of it. Of course, to be a good research historian, you have to be a good skeptic. So I needed more proof. I asked a friend of mine, who was really into photography, where I could find the best photo lab in the state, aside from the one over at NSA. With his answer, I called Annapolis Color, and when I told the guy there what I thought I had, he casually replied that they get that sort of stuff all the time, and it's usually easily explained away. So he told me, just bring the negative on over. The following day, however, he called me and was a good deal more enthusiastic. He told me to get there as soon as I can. Quote, you've got a real one here, unquote. When examining a negative, professional photographers tend to talk in terms of what's hot and what's not, which relates to the amount of light that has impinged on the film. In the case of my photograph, the expert pointed out several things that I hadn't noticed. By the way, the white spot seen here is a speck of dust on my print, and it is not on the negative. The first indication that this was not a reflection of a huge tree is here. If this were such a reflection, the area between here and here would be hotter, and follow the curve of the branch line along this line. Next is this hot spot, and this one. Both indicate that if this were a branch, it would have to be floating in midair. This appears to be more like the crook of an arm. Then he pointed out something on the image that he had blown way up. It sent a shiver up my spine. Look here, he said, with some satisfaction. You can see her face. For those of you who still think that this is nothing but a big branch of a tree, 
Here's a photo showing the wider area of the grounds. The closest big tree is almost 200 feet away. This was the only large tree near the building, and it is way off to the side and was far off to my left when I took the photo. In discussing this with my younger brother, the guy with the master's degree in historic preservation from Columbia, he was totally skeptical, to the point of pure denial. That was a good thing. We sat down with all the photos that I had taken of the property. We mapped out all the trees, as well as my positions when I took the photos. Here are all the tall trees, as they were in 1998. Here's the short tree. This is the keeper's quarters. And this is the lighthouse. This is my position according to the area captured by my first image. And this is my position for the ghost image. Remember that the angle of reflection must be the same as the angle of the view. There's nothing to reflect. So who is this Lady of the Lakes? Well, I have a few ideas, but that will be another video. If, uh, of course, you folks would like to see it.